Hi, I'm Michelle Chalfant, psychotherapist, holistic life coach, and human, just like you, learning to navigate life challenges. With over 25 years experience, I teach people how to get healthy using the adult chair model. The adult chair model is where simple psychology meets grounded spirituality, and it teaches us how to become healthy adults. From anxiety and depression to codependency and relationship issues, you can use the adult chair for just about anything. Each week, I share practical tips, tools, and advice from myself and a wide range of experts on how to get unstuck, how to live authentically, and how to truly love yourself, all while sitting in your adult chair. Welcome to the Adult Chair Podcast. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Adult Chair Podcast. I am Michelle Shelfont. Welcome to February, the month of love. Oh yeah. In case you haven't heard the whole month in the membership this month, we're talking about love and that's giving and receiving love. And I realize many of us are not great at that. So we've got to learn how to do that. And that's what we're doing. And if you'd like to try the membership out, I'm giving it to you for $1 through Valentine's day. That's at the adult chair.com forward slash membership. And for those of you that are new to the show, head over to the adultchair.com. There is so much information in there. You have, we have tons of free information like meditations and journaling prompts and all kinds of great things. And the newest offering that's free, free, free. I love to give you guys stuff for free. This is a really exciting 2021 offer for all of you. We have now the adult chair meetup groups. And I had called them the month of January. I was calling them TAC gatherings. You know what? If you listen to the, to last week's show on decision-making, every time I said that TAC gatherings, it felt wrong. I was like, my heart does not resonate with that term. So I changed it. I've changed the name, which my heart opens when I say this, TAC circles. So the adult chair circles are meetup groups that we are meeting with around the world. Yes. Uh, We have already formed a number of groups. So if you'd like to join a group, even if it's not in your exact city, you can check it out and try it out and see if if you like it. Um, Just go to theadultchair.com forward slash TAC, T-A-C, circles. And you can join people that are really living with and practicing to live in their adult chair. So it's a group of people that are really on their path, on the path of healing and transformation. And we get to do that, of course, eventually in person, but for now on Zoom. Yeah, we're going to be doing that all around the world. The next launch of new locations is in April. So if you're interested in joining a group or leading a group in your area, anywhere around the world, just go to the adultchair.com forward slash TAC circles, and you can join there. All right. So today on the show, I had the lovely Meredith Miller. What a show we had. Today, I'm talking to you all about identifying and healing from narcissistic abuse and sexual abuse. Meredith is an expert in this after having lived with this for 30 years eight years. We talked all about really, and this is the word identifying. We jumped in there. What I realized is so many people don't even know that they're in a psychologically abusive relationship. Meredith and I talked about that. We talked all about the trauma, how you overcome and heal from trauma, the powerlessness that we feel. We talked about taking responsibility victim, self-care, so many things. This is, there's a lot of really, really great information for healing in this episode. So let me tell you a little bit about Meredith. Meredith Miller is a coach, the author of The Journey, A Roadmap for Self-Healing After Narcissistic Abuse, speaker. And she is, she's dedicated to helping people to self-heal after psychological and sexual abuse. Her background is in the holistic healing arts and personal development field. Meredith's mission is to bridge the gap between trauma and purpose. We had a phenomenal show. I'm going to jump right over to Meredith right now. Enjoy this show. So welcome to the show, Meredith Miller. Thank you so much for inviting me. Yeah, Meredith, I mean... 
your story is unbelievable. And I was just saying to you prior to starting the show, thank you for the work that you're doing because people need to hear from you and your story. And um, tell us about your story because in my experience of being a therapist and a coach, I can't tell you the number of people over the last 25, almost 30 years now that have sat in front of me and had no idea that they were in an abusive relationship. They had no idea, no idea. And I, I'm wondering and, and hoping that the people that listen to this might also go, oh my gosh, is that me? Is that what's wrong? And you know, we're so, we so often blame ourselves, yeah. think something's wrong with ourselves, with us. And I'm hoping that your story really touches a lot of people and helps them. So share with us wherever you want to begin, like tell us a little bit about your history and your story. So, you know, like you mentioned, a lot of people can't recognize it. They don't realize what's happening. And I think that's because those are the more covert cases, the more mm -hmm. hidden, sophisticated, very disguised forms of abuse. So that's the more psychological nature. And I think often people like, you know, five years ago, when I started telling people what I do, they would immediately tell me, so you work with battered women. And I'm like, mm. no, one, very few of them are actually physically abused. Like over hundreds of people that I've talked to, a small handful of them were ever physically harmed or touched. Mm -hmm. Two, about half the victims were women. The other half were men. Wow. And I think that's another thing in society that, you know, we have these misconceptions that like the man is always the abuser. And that is not the case all the time wow. that men and women are capable of that. And that was the story of my family where, you know, I come from a transgenerational legacy of this form of abuse. It's psychological. Mm -hmm. And my family was also sexual abuse going on too. But it was the very covert form, the type mm -hmm. where, you know, your abuser is adored by everybody. The family thinks they're this wonderful pillar of society and a saint. And, you know, they do all those acts. And that's the most dangerous thing is that the more sophisticated, the more covert they are, the more dangerous they are because of how far they get in a structure, in a system, like a family system, in a society you know, in the world and nobody realizes and they disguise themselves as humanitarians. And yes. Nobody knows what goes on behind closed doors. And the problem I find, and please share, nobody believes like, no, so-and-so wouldn't treat you like that. No, they must've been having a bad day. No, there's some abuse going on. I, um, I've done a few shows actually on covert narcissism and covert abuse, but for those people that didn't hear those shows, can you share, share what that even means? I just want to make sure everyone understands what that even give us maybe an example or two of what covert psychological abuse looks like. So like at a very spiritual level, we could say that it is evil, like the true form of evil that pretends mm -hmm. to be good. Yeah. So this is the person that is destroying you, but on the surface, they're acting like an altruist. Yeah. Like they just want the best for you. And they set up the whole structure so that if you challenge anything they say or do, they flip it around that you're the bad person, that mm -hmm. you lack compassion. You're not appreciative. You're not grateful for all yeah. that they've done for you. And, and that's why it's so insidious. And like you said, it's like, people don't believe you. That's actually the worst part, not just like the covert psychological abuse, but also this happens to so many victims of childhood sexual abuse, where you try to tell people and they don't believe you. Mm. And that, that is the most damaging psychological part of mm -hmm. the whole, like it's way worse than the actual abuse that took place because now like your sanity is on the line. Oh. And when, when you get to that point where you don't know what's real and what's not, I mean, mm -hmm. you know, but then everybody around you is telling, you, no, that's not reality. Like what you're perceiving is not reality that really messes with your mind. Yeah. It's interesting. Um, I was speaking with a client the other day and they were sharing with me that they said to their husband, um, that they had applied for a new job. And, um, they were really excited about it. And, um, and their husband said, well, why would you do that? Yeah. So again, that's like how subtle 
it's yep. so subtle. And then it makes us, of course, doubt ourselves. And well, well, my, maybe I shouldn't be applying for a job. And da, da, da. it's like, no, no, no. Apply for that job. Don't listen to the person that you're married to that supposedly loves you and supports you. It's where it's like the brain doesn't understand how to even comprehend such a thing. Um, so tell us more. Tell us a little bit about 38 years of your own. I mean, whatever that you're willing to share, um, your story, because I think stories are so powerful, powerful in our own healing and recognizing. Yeah, 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 yeah. And recognizing like, oh my gosh, that's me. I didn't even know. Didn't even right. know that was abuse. So That breakthrough moment for me with my family happened when I was almost 38. So like I had been in many relationships and I would figure out the relationships, but I, I still wasn't really able to face the family. Like I knew, but I, you know, that cognitive dissonance, like you just mentioned that the brain, right? What it does, it's like, you, you see this person, they're supposed to love you. They're your family member or your husband, your wife, et cetera. And then you see this other side of them. And so the brain, what happens is it can't hold on to these two opposing belief systems. So it short circuits into denial and you keep going back into denial. So I was doing that for almost 38 years. Mm -hmm. I had gone to Peru. I drank a lot of ayahuasca, wachuma, psychedelic medicines, try to figure this out. Yeah. And I was starting to figure out a lot of things. And I had to go back home to my parents' house because I had nothing. I was like totally destroyed. It's the bottom of the bottom. And I went right back to where it all started. And that was all this like divine orchestration because wow. there I was like, yeah, you know, in that first part where you can't get out of bed, you don't want to like brush your teeth. You don't want to take a shower. Like you just, you can't function when you're at the bottom of the bottom PTSD crash that lasted a few weeks. I finally started getting inspired again and coming out. And I realized like, I wanted to help people recover after trauma. So I was like, you know, I was doing holistic coaching and healing before. And I was like, this is the new focus for my work. I got all excited. All of a sudden I went downstairs to tell my mom, like the exciting news. And she's sitting at this dining table, like piles of catalogs. And she's doing something very important there. And I'm like, mom, I'm so excited. I figured out what I'm going to do. I'm going to like get my website started again. I'm going to coach people and help them heal after trauma and PTSD. And she looked up at me sideways and she was just like, why are you thinking about doing that coaching again? It's never worked before. Just go to the mall and get a job. Oh. And in that moment, it was like everything just shattered and aligned. And like, I saw the insanity of my own participation in that dynamic. So wow. it was no longer about her. And I realized I'm going to this person for support. That's me. Like, that's my choice. I put myself in that situation. It's not my fault what she does. That's on her. But now it was like, that was the moment I took the reins of my destiny back and realized mm -hmm. like, I can no longer go to this person for support. I need to find that in myself. I need to set new boundaries. I need to like get out of this situation and get on with my life. So for me, that was the moment that I first took responsibility over my life. Like mm. the decision that changed the rest of my life. And like, that is the first threshold I tell people in the healing journey. Um, you know, Joseph Campbell created the hero's journey and, you know, the three mm -hmm. stages mm -hmm. that we all go through in life. It's like this human archetype. And so that first stage, when we're talking to the abuse victim, that first stage is the victimhood, the mm -hmm. powerlessness. And the key is that that is a stage that is not a life sentence. That is not, you're forever a victim because of what happened to you. That is, you are a victim now until you get over that first threshold and take the power back in your life. And that empowerment is the self-responsibility. That's the day the rest of your life changes. Now that's not the end of the story. That's the beginning yes. of healing. Yes. Right? you make that commitment to yourself. Mm -hmm. And then that means that in every moment of every day, you need to hold yourself responsible. Mm -hmm. And so there's going to be lots of tests and trials and tribulations that come up and that's where the healing takes place. So step one is take responsibility, take your power back and stop leaning outside of yourself for people that can't give you the support. Is that how you'd break it down? Sort of not step one, but the first threshold before that, there's threshold. a lot of things that happen. Like first mm -hmm. people need to find out what's going on. So some event will happen. People are living in denial. That's basically where it starts, right? We all live yeah. in denial. And then there's a disruptive truth 
something mm. that shatters your reality. It's like, I call these the frying pan to the head moments. Yeah, yeah. People will stay in the relationship, even though they kind of know it's abuse and kind of, you know, but then there's something that so drastic happens that suddenly pierces the denial and shakes them out of that. And now they can't not see the truth. Yes. But then they go back into self-denial, self-doubt, especially that I, can I really do this? Maybe I should just stay. Yeah. And then, so there's like this struggle in this process. And so during that part, that's when people, you'll probably hear from people that they just get obsessed with the topic. They go online, they watch videos, they read mm-hmm. articles, they mm-hmm. read books, like they have to learn everything about it because you're trying to understand what's going on. And then eventually that moment comes and it's a spontaneous moment. You can't mm. force it. Mm-hmm. where something happens and that's when you take the reins of responsibility over your life that's the threshold from mm. powerlessness into empowerment I love it so did you grow up then but were both of your parents uh, abusive narcissists like what was going on at home was that typical like a typical response from your mom that like your whole life that you were getting like not really supportive and What's yeah, that that's like growing def- up? that was definitely my mother's character and my two grandfathers. But my dad is the typical codependent, like a really uh, good man, a good heart, yeah. did not protect us, did not put up boundaries, just yeah. let her, you know, and, and so it's, it's that typical, it's that typical structure where there's like a codependent parent. And that's not always the case. Sometimes there's mm-hmm. two, tra- there's two disordered parents and they have a hierarchy you know, mm-hmm. one of them is on top and then the other one is like the beta, the alpha and the beta, right? I've heard those situations, but in my family, it was more the codependent narcissistic structure. Yeah. Wow. So then what happened? So you had this awakening, this epiphany, like, wait a minute, it's not resonating with me anymore. Like I'm, I'm going to take my power back. I'm going to take responsibility. I'm not going to lean on mom. What happened next? Like what, tell us a little bit more about your journey. It was a long struggle. So finally, eventually I had a friend in California. She was like, just come out here, spend the winter with me, get on your feet again, whatever. Mm -hmm. Well, that ended up being a trap, but it got me away from the house. It got me to like get distance from that, you know, Mm -hmm. Thanksgiving called home and, you know, I was still struggling. It still wasn't working. And you talk to her and she says, you know, we just, we just want the best for you, but Mm -hmm. you, you hear inside, like it sounds crazy to people, but you know, inside, like, I just knew in that moment, that was a lie. Like that is such a lie. That's not what she wants. She wants to see me fail and go back and be dependent again. And so for me, like that was the moment that I set the boundary where I decided from now on, I only share things in past tense with this person. Ooh, I like that. Anytime you're like dealing with a toxic person and you're trying to create something, it's still in the nascent stage, right? You know, when you eventually down the road, you get so much momentum going on your goals and everything that like nothing is going to stop that train. Mm -hmm. But when you're trying to get things up and going, you cannot share your hopes and dreams with toxic people. They will just take a big crap all over that. And then it's like the wind gets sucked right out of your sails. And you go back into the self-doubt and the paralysis and all that. So yeah, past tense only. That was one of the first boundaries that I set, but it was, it was a long process. I finally got on my feet again. I finally got my own apartment. I ended up going back to Portland and then I started the YouTube channel just five years ago. Mm-hmm. And like the day before I was going to launch the YouTube channel, the Facebook thing and all that, my dad joined Facebook and I was like, Oh, oh was no. Like, oh my God. Like, <laughs> Yeah, I can't, I can't speak the truth now, you know, and yeah. like, that's like, it's always this fear of like, it, when you speak the truth, you're going to get in trouble because in childhood, you learn like there are things you don't talk about. You mm-hmm. definitely don't talk about the abuse or you're going to mm-hmm. get in trouble. And that was the moment I realized like, no, I'm committed. Like I need, I need to speak the truth. Whatever happens, happens. Mm. And I need to get it out there. It was still another year and a half before I set the no contact boundary with my mother. Oh, really? And, that was what really changed my life because oh, wow. like your nervous system gets programmed to recognize that as a, as home and as love. Yeah. So if you're still entertaining that and you're still accepting that in your life from anyone and particularly the early, you know, the original abusers in your life, mm-hmm. you're continually programming your nervous system to keep recognizing that as home in love. So then you're going to keep falling into it with other people. They might be more and more covert. Mm -hmm. It might be harder to see at first, Mm -hmm. but you're going to realize you keep getting into that until you fully 
cut that off, then you start to reprogram your nervous system and your nervous system stops betraying you because you can know. And that's what I learned. Like I knew all of this stuff about abuse and I found myself in another situation again. I'm like, how did that happen? It doesn't matter how much, you know, consciously that's 12% of your mind. The other 88% of your subconscious yeah. is programmed on that. So you have to actually reprogram all of those behaviors, all of those actions. And those actions start with not allowing those people in your life, setting those boundaries. So, so true. This is why when we end one relationship with somebody that's an abuser or a narcissist, um, and then we don't work on ourselves and go inside, then we're going to go jump from one relationship and maybe attract someone that looks very different. And it's a different kind of narcissist or, you know, it's, it turns out to be the same freaking person. Exactly. So important that we stop, pause and do our own healing and transform those programs. I talk a lot about programs. I agree hundred percent with you. Got to work on yourself. There's got to be that pause in between the next relationship. Um, so you, so you ended up then setting up a boundary with your mom and cut all the whole relationship. Is that what right. happened? Completely. Yeah. Yeah. But and like you said, like, you know, that's like, we have to take responsibility for our own healing. And I think the big temptation is to keep focusing on the other person. And, and even some people think, well, once I go no contact, that's the end. Like that's the yeah. healing for me. And that's not it at all. That that's just the boundary that protects all the healing work you do, because until you set the boundary, you're going to keep re-traumatizing yourself. You're going to keep digging a deeper hole. So you set the boundary and that kind of keeps this protection. Now you can do the deeper inner work, mm. which is the deep self-care work. And that's going to take years. Like, especially if a person grew up in this, it's not yeah. like, it's not a quick fix. And I think in our culture, a lot of people really want the quick fix, the overnight oh, yeah. fix, the pill to take. The pill. Give me the pill. Yeah. yeah. No. Mm -mm. And it is not. It's messy. It's dirty. It's painful. It's horrible for a while, but it gets better and better mm -hmm. as you work through the stuff. It's really about, and again, this is my opinion. I'd like to hear your opinion. But for me, when I'm working with people that have gone through something like this, it really is about uh, rebuilding the self. I mean, you're rebuilding self-worth because- it's gone, you know, or it's, it's minim, minimal self-worth. So it really is about rebuilding really who you are, your whole identity. And it takes time, hundred okay. um, percent. What would you say to somebody that is in a relationship, they have a family, children, and they're stuck because they're married to somebody that is being abusive or they are a narcissist and they're starting to realize, gosh, you know, maybe this is what's going on in my life. What do they do? So I think the very first thing people need to look at is their financial independence. Mm -hmm. And that's usually what happens in these relationships is something, whether it's a man or a woman, somehow people end up financially dependent on the abusive person in mm -hmm. some way. Yep. So, so true. People need to quietly, like not telling them, not announcing what they're doing, but quietly start working on creating financial independence because that gives you a foundation for which you can figure out where you're going to go after that. You have no options. And so you have that basically, unless you have somewhere you can go, a family member or something like that, who's going to help you for a period of time, but still you're going to need to create the financial independence to get on with your life. Mm -hmm. Right. And so you mentioned the self-worth and that really is, that is the start of the rebuilding of the mm -hmm. self. And I, I talk about the four pillars of recovery and that's the very first one. And so self-worth is very connected with our finances, our actual monetary value. These are very connected. And so when our self-worth is low, sometimes it's very hard to make money mm -hmm. or people will go to work and they're not getting paid what they deserve to be getting paid. Like everybody else is getting the raise and the promotion and they're not, and they're getting overlooked or they get a job and then something happens or they make money and then something crazy happens with their car and the money goes and like these sorts of events will happen. But as we rebuild the self-worth, so that's the other thing that simultaneously we need to be working on internally, mm -hmm. you know, as we're trying to leave a situation like that is rebuilding the self-worth and no longer defining ourself through the other because mm. the narcissistic or the abusive person or the family system structure, even society structure teaches the victim that you have no worth. Right. And so 
in, in doing that, they define your identity. So it's mm-hmm. like belonging to a cult. The very first thing they do is take away your individual identity and replace it with a group identity. Mm. So they define you and your role in that story. So you need to start taking the pen back and rewriting your role, not getting confrontational with that person. You never want to do that. That can be actually very dangerous to a person's life, not just their sanity and their health, but their actual life and well-being, not getting confrontational, but doing this work internally Mm -hmm. to rebuild the self-worth, to redefine who you are. And that self-worth starts with looking at your values. Like what really matters to you? Not what everybody else is telling you should matter to you and you should think and you should believe and you should do and all this, but what really matters to you because when you figure out what has value for you in your life, then you know how to set up standards and boundaries to protect that value. Exactly, yeah. And as you do that, as you continually set these boundaries and protect the value and what really matters to you, that's how your self-worth grows. So true. I, th- I, t- I talk about this. It's like, it's sort of like a diamond. If you don't see yourself like a precious diamond, then what are you going to protect? There's, there are no boundaries. You have to get to know what's going on on the inside. Who are you? I've worked with a lot of people and I'll, people and I'll say things as simple as like, so what's your favorite food? And they're like, gosh, I don't even know. Like, it's like the inside is just gone. You know, I know what my children like and I know what my so-and-so likes and my husband and my wife, I know what they like. I, you know, I don't, you know, I like everything, you know, they're very, you know, there isn't like a concrete, well, what's your favorite this, you know, do you like to do this? And they're so outwardly focused and like, well, we got to bring it in got to build that self-worth. Um, and I really, I love what you said about finances. And that's one of the first things I say too, is like, go download and print and give to a friend or put in a safe everything in your finances. Cause the moment that person you're with thinks you might want to leave, they're going to transfer money. So get all of your statements, put them somewhere, take pictures of them. So you know, what's going on up front. Um, what about the people that say to you, well, my whomever, again, husband, wife, whoever you're in a relationship, my mother, father, whomever, I really have hope that they may change someday. So, so I can't end that relationship because, you know, I'm praying for them. I'm working with them. They're going to therapy with me now. I think they're just going to change. What are, tell us about that. What do you say to someone that says that? I think it's very normal to have that hope. You know, and I think, you know, you just got to yeah, allow people to go through that phase where they have the hope and their hopes get crushed. It is inevitable mm-hmm. that's going to happen, mm-hmm. that it ends up being a form of toxic hope yeah. where you're hoping for something that's never going to happen. You're hoping for an unreality. Mm-hmm. And well, I think it's very fair to give people a chance to change what for people sure. find yeah. very quickly because some yeah. people do change, right? Some people but do. Yeah. I think the danger is that we project sometimes our own qualities in other people. Well, I've changed. I've drastically transformed my life. So of course this person could too. Well, yeah, they could, yeah. but will they, will they choose to do that? And so, you know, you got to set a deadline for yourself is what I tell people. Like, what is, what is the deadline? What is the expiration date? Mm. If there is no change by this point, that's the point where your plan B kicks in, you know, where you have to bury the toxic hope, because I think that's the hardest thing to let go of. It's not just the person or the relationship, but the whole idea of it, like the fantasy of it all, mm-hmm. having the perfect family, the husband, yeah. the wife, the children, or the wife and wife, the husband, husband, whatever the family mm-hmm. structure is, but having mm-hmm. that perfect structure, and then it's all, it's all gone. It turns mm-hmm. out that's not like that. And that is the hardest part for, I think, people to let go of. So true. Um but I, I agree. It's like, you know, some people can change. I, I always say, well, I have hope too. I haven't seen it, especially when there's extreme abuse going on oh, no. because they, they can't own that they're the problem or that they contribute to the problem at all. Um, what about people that have children, small children, and they have many years that they could spend with this person that they're in a relationship with? Um, I found that when a marriage ends or a relationship ends, um, that the abuser, the narcissist, et cetera, uh, really comes back and gives that 
ex a very difficult time. You know, they try to influence the children and there, and many, many, many people that I've worked with and have left have said, I think it would have been easier if I just stayed in the, in the abusive marriage. What do you say to that? Because I mean, it's, it's, a, it's such a hard one because they do, they create a living hell when they're left, you know, when someone divorces them. So what do you say to that? I think it's inevitable that's going to happen. I've heard that in every story, every single story. They don't yeah. just go away usually without a fight. So you have to be prepared to fight if that's what you want. And I think that some people will stay for the children. Like that's what they mm -hmm. say, well, until mm -hmm. they're 18 or whatever. But I encourage people also to look at the contrary of that. Like your children are learning from you. You yeah. are helping to program your children for life. Like they're going to go out in life and experience relationships as you have modeled for them at home. Do you want to model for them that they should tolerate abuse, that they should tolerate this kind of behavior, just like you have tolerated, or are you going to stand up? Mm -hmm. Are you going to stand up for yourself? And are you going to model that for your kids? And are you going to stand up for your kids too? Because your kids are also getting abused by that person. You know, maybe not as much as you are at the moment, but that can all change at any moment. As soon as they figure out who they can use the most as pawn pieces in the chess game. And so people really need to think about what they're modeling for their children. Definitely expecting that the fight is going to happen. You have to be prepared for that. Mm -hmm. and so what I tell parents is, you know, the best thing you can do is be the lighthouse because there is a big storm at sea, your kids are lost at sea, you know, what do you really want? Like, do you want to be out there struggling with them at sea, your boat's going down, they're going down with you? Or do you want to be that lighthouse and you get yourself healthy and you get yourself strong and you shine your light so that one day your kids can find the shore too, because they're going to go through their own process. You know, they're going to have some part custody over there, probably maybe even the abusive person wins majority custody. Sometimes that happens, you know, eventually the kids are going to get to their own breaking point. Eventually the kids are going to notice those patterns repeating in their life with their friendships, even as kids mm -hmm. that will happen in their friendship dynamics with their teachers, with, with everything in life. So, you know, the parent needs to be that lighthouse for the kids. Otherwise they have no chance. Yeah. They need to see a healthy adult in the household. Yeah. Healthy. They don't know what, because we think that how our parents act is normal and that's how all parents are acting. Right? right. And that's how we should have relationships. So that's, I like that. The lighthouse, it's a great analogy or a metaphor, excuse me. Um, you talk about self-care as the core work of recovery after abuse and trauma. And I just want to say something in, in a, with abuse. And I say this all the time. If someone's getting physically abused, get out immediately, yeah. immediately. Yeah. Like there is no sticking around for physical abuse. And I, you know, again, I could say the same thing about fit, psychological abuse, but it's like you said, it's trickier. Um, but self-care is not selfish. And when we have such an outward focus, when we're in relationships, um, that are unhealthy, it's so hard to bring that attention back in. And we do feel like it's selfish. So talk about that a little bit. Tell us, please tell us it's not selfish because I preach this all the time. I need someone on my, on my team. <laughs> I, I, heard, the same message. <laughs> I heard you and Nicole talking about that actually. Um, and that's so true. It is not selfish. It is self-responsible. Yeah. So I teach people to start rewiring that, reframing that in their brain, that it is self-responsible. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, the other people around you, like your partner, whoever the abusive person is, is going to guilt trip you. They're going to shame you mm -hmm. for prioritizing your self-care. So you have to be prepared that the manipulation is going to come because you prioritizing your self-care, you taking responsibility for yourself means that you're no longer going to be giving some kind of energy resources to them that they were used to mm -hmm. getting from you. Yeah. I feel like too, um, I think that when people are coming out of relationships like this, they're so, um, they've been, you know, they're in a relationship with someone that is gaslighting them all the time. That's telling them a, really a false reality. And then we, we believe it. What I recommend is that people find like a friend or a family member that they really know that's going to tell them the truth. And I call it a touchstone for truth so that they can go to my best friend or even my boss or my whomever, my sister and say, okay, this is what just happened at home. Can you tell me, you know, is that healthy or not healthy? And um, this happens a lot when people are codependent and they're coming out of it. Like, 
what's my reality? Like, is that healthy or not? Like, we really don't know. So I just want to share that with people that are listening, like find one person, you don't need 20, you need one person. Maybe it's a coach, maybe it's a therapist that can give you, that can be that touchstone for truth because we're so distorted in our thinking. We need someone to kind of clear out the, the fog. So we know like what the heck healthy looks like, cause we really just don't know. Um, you talk about trauma being both devastating and awakening and that you can't go back to how you were before the trauma yet. It's not an entirely bad thing. So talk about that a little bit. Um, talk about that a little bit, that it's not a bad thing. One of the struggles that I often see with victims is they say, I just want to go back to how I was. I just yeah. want to go back to how things were. And I notice that right now in society, a lot of people are like, I just want to go back to when it was normal, you know, soon we'll just get back there. And that's never going to happen because once the trauma comes through, it devastates something, it cuts deep into you. You're never going to be the same person. Your life is never going to be the same. The way you look at the world, the way you perceive things, the way you see other people, none of that is ever going to be the same. And I think a lot of people think, well, that's just a bad thing because now it's all tainted with trauma, but it doesn't have to stay there. That's just mm -hmm. like staying in the victimhood. It's not a life sentence. We can change that. So the trauma, what it does is it awakens us to this whole new potential. And as we start to do the inner work of healing, we start to discover the parts of ourselves that aren't hurt, the parts of ourselves that we never noticed before because yeah. we were just, we were locked in to this reality, this perception, this, this world that we lived in. And now that world is gone. Yeah. And now we're seeing the world in a very different way. And now we have the opportunity to redefine ourselves. Mm -hmm. So often you'll hear about, you know, like the dark night of the soul type of a yeah. thing, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's not one night, it's a long period of time, but where people go through traumatic experiences and then something amazing happens where they do the healing work and then they transform that trauma into a new sense of purpose mm -hmm. that gives them something to contribute. It gives them something to live for that they didn't have before. They start to find some kind of calling in life. They feel like they're doing what they're really born here to do. Like they didn't just come here to work and pay bills until they die. Like mm -hmm. there's something much more. And I think that might be the big opportunity that we all have in the world right now, as we are going through this collective dark night of the soul. Yeah. To redefine who we are individually. And then all of us individuals are making up the collective, right? And so who are we really as the collective? Mm -hmm. And how are we living in this world? How are we perceiving the world? How are we interacting with it? What legacy are we leaving in this world? Yeah. I love how you said that. I remember I did a podcast um, on codependency. And I talked about how, because so many people, when they realize that they're codependent, let's say, um, are they beat up on themselves. Right. And I said, and the, the whole, I don't, I don't have to put in the show notes what number it was because I've done a few on codependency. I don't remember, but it was like, um, I talked a lot about how it's almost like the first day of your life. And it can be a really great thing. When we discover that we're codependent, you got the rest of your life to find out who you are, right? And it's, it could be a very exciting time. So I feel like even with this, it's about reframing. Wait a minute, are you stuck in story and victim? You got to bust that story. I, I, you know, in working with people, they get, they do get to, oh, my life will never be the same. It's going to be, uh, it's like, wait, 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 wait. You have the awakening. You have that epiphany. You got to drop that story and look forward into your future. Like what can happen now? And your whole life can unfold. I love what you just said. I really align with that for sure. It's really like the first day of your life and yeah. so many great, you're going to become this person and you find parts of yourself that you didn't even know existed. Exactly. Yeah. And suddenly you realize, wow, I had no idea how, I, how empowered I was. I had no idea. I didn't know I was that strong. I didn't know I could set boundaries like this. So it can be a huge awakening for people, but right. we've got to not look in the past, look it in the past, beating up on yourself, judging yourself. Why did I pick this person? It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. What do you do about it now? Right. That's the challenge with trauma is it, it locks us into like frozen in the past. Yes. And so then we're not interacting with the present. We're not creating a future based on some new possibility. We're only interacting with the past. 
Yeah. And so that's why we have to do that trauma work. That's why like, that's where the real healing takes place so that we can get out of that past structure so we can mm. redefine ourselves and empower ourselves forward. How do we help people um, like wake up if they're in a situation? What would you say to someone? Again, someone might be listening to this. I'm hoping a lot of people are listening going, oh my gosh, that might be me. Um, but how do we help people go, boom, there it is. I think this is my life. How do you give someone an epiphany moment? What would you say to that? I think you don't really do that. I think you, you can put the information out there. Like, let's say it's your sister and mm -hmm. you see your sister in an abusive relationship and you sit her down and you're like, look, I really love you. And I know that you really love your husband. Um, but I noticed this, I noticed that, I noticed that this is abuse you know, what's going to happen in that situation? Yeah. Is your sister going to go, oh my God, you're right. I need to get out of this. No. What's going to happen is she's going to get upset. Mm -hmm. She's going to get angry at you because you are confronting her with truth that she does not want to see because she's totally invested in the fantasy mm. at this point. Mm -hmm. So she's not even listening. I mean, you can come to her with all this evidence and rational information and facts. Mm -hmm. and she can't even see it. Her brain will delete it. Mm -hmm. And she'll attack you for trying to show her. So what you're going to find is that it, it's like, it, you can't confront a person with this. Like they, you can, you can lead a horse to water, right? But mm -hmm. they need to realize on their own. And it's going to come, unfortunately, through the frying pan lesson. Humans, we, we don't decide to just change usually until something really drastic happens. Right. And right. that's probably what's going to happen. And then eventually your sister's going to come to you six months later, a year later, however long later. And she's going to say, okay, you're right. This mm -hmm. is what's happening. I need help. Okay. At that point, that's when you can really start to help this person, giving them resources, giving them ideas, but that person has to come to you or to their therapist or whoever, mm -hmm. like saying, I, I need help. I need out. I fully realize like they had to have had that piercing moment of denial where they're now ready to get out until that point, you're wasting your energy. You're wasting your time. You're going to end up having this like very animosity based relationship. And mm -hmm. you could even, you could even be in harm's way because that person is going to defend the abuser and might very well go to the abuser and tell the abuser what you're telling them. Yeah. I've now heard that, that happen. Yeah. That person comes after you. Yeah. So it's a very dangerous situation. It is. I agree. Um, I would wonder if people could say, just ask a question like, Hey, how did that feel when, when he talked to you like that, maybe like little itty bitty questions and to see it's sort of like, are they going to pick up the breadcrumb that I'm dropping in front of them? Right. And maybe they will go for it and maybe not, but I, yeah, when you come at someone with, Oh my God, what are you in this relationship for? They're going to definitely defend. But, um, if someone's listening to this, that is questioning gosh, is this my relationship, whether it be with their mother, father, sister, brother, whomever in the whole world, you know, or their boss or, or partner. Um, what I just want to share is take a moment to drop into your body and really get, start getting in tune with the body and how it makes you feel when this person is speaking to you. Because I find that like you were talking about the nervous system, like we shut it down. Mm -hmm. So we stop feeling Exactly. What feels so bad and devastating, turn up the volume on the body, like start getting in touch with what's going on inside. And you'll notice this does feel bad. And if it does feel bad, go find that one person, go find your touchstone for truth. Again, therapist, coach, best friend, whomever that's going to tell you the truth and start asking questions. Do you feel like this relationship is not the best? Is it abusive? Whatever words you want to use, but start asking some questions to one person that you feel like you can trust, that you can trust. Do you have anything else you want to add to that? That's so important. That piece about the body that you recommended yeah. because we get dissociated. So there's going to be a split trauma mm -hmm. causes a split between the mind and the body. So people will dissociate from the body. They won't feel, they won't, they won't even, at first you try to get them to focus on their body. They won't even really, yeah. like, you'll see they struggle to even connect with the body because they're so invested in, in the mental constructs, right? Mm -hmm. And so doing the embodiment practice is really important for people to sit down and really just tune into their body. It's gonna be a big struggle at first, 
but if, if people can trace like the feeling of something, so, you know, like the inner child wound, whatever that is, whether mm. it's loneliness, abandonment, rejection, those tend to be the three big ones. Mm-hmm. If people can identify which one of those, you know, is the typical theme that keeps repeating in their life. Yep. And if you ask them, like, what does that feel like in your body? Like, what does rejection feel like in your body? Or what does abandonment feel like in your body? At first, they might be like, well, it's just kind of all over, right? Yeah. Because they can't focus yet. But as they practice and practice the mindfulness, they start to notice, oh, you know, it's this, it's this feeling in my chest, or it's, I get this feeling in my gut. And then this happens, and then that happens. And they start to notice the chain reaction of what happens when the emotions Mm -hmm. trigger that feeling, you know, and then if they can start to locate that feeling, now they're starting to connect to that. Now they're starting to connect to their body. They're starting to connect to how they feel Mm -hmm. versus the numbing because trauma will cause, it's like a a, a light switch. It it, first, like it numbs everything out. And so then all the emotion is numb and then a trigger comes along and something reminds us of all that feeling that we have numbed off. Mm -hmm. And then it's hyper reactivity, right? And it's all systems on. And so we will go back and forth between these two, like hyper reactivity and numbness, hyper reactivity Mm -hmm. and numbness during that trauma process. So getting in touch with the body starts to help people getting out of that awakening. They start to notice more often during the day, how they feel, because Mm -hmm. most people just aren't even aware of that. Even with the busyness of life, so right, we can get distracted. Mm-hmm. So that embodiment practice is really important to get people reconnected, the mind and body again. Mm, love it. Thank you. Anything else you want to share? This was so good. Again, I, I know we talked about that healing is not an overnight thing. Like that's what we talked about in the beginning. It's not a magic pill. Um, the awareness or that piercing of the illusion is the first step for sure. Um, but if, when we work at this in the beginning, like you said, it's, it's, it's upsetting, it's emotional, but we do get stronger and become someone we never even dreamed that we could be really so beautiful. Um, but anything else you want to share about this? Anything at all? I think that's probably a great way to end it to say like, it is worth it. Like yeah. the struggle, it's going to be long. It's going to be hard. There's going to be a lot of ups and downs. There's going to be moments where you want to give up and just mm-hmm. stop and, take the easy button, but keep going because it's going to be worth it. There is a whole other life that you can't even imagine right now on the other side. So finish your story. We started with your story. So you went through then this process when you were 38 with your mom, um, having said that to you and you had your epiphany, your awakening moment. Um, And then you went through years of your own healing and transformation. And now what? Tell us just where are you now in life? Now I feel like I'm in the thriving stage of my life. Yeah. Where I'm no longer entertaining those people in my life. I don't have those dynamics anymore. The new people that I meet are not of those dynamics. Everybody has their own issues and everything, but it's no longer that same old dynamic. And so yeah. I'm constantly learning more about myself. I'm constantly still healing. I feel like it's a work in process. You know, when you grow up in a family like this, it's like, it's something you're working on the rest of your life. And it's not, it's not anything to be ashamed of. And you can still be thriving in life Mm -hmm. and continually working on personal growth and healing. And eventually, you know, you start to get into, you know, the relationships that I have now with people are based on mutual growth. Mm -hmm. So the people that I meet, even if it's for a short period of time that we coincide, or maybe it'll be for the longer run, it's like there's this mutual inspiration of growth that's taking place mm. where I'm seeing things that I need to work on. They're seeing things they need to work on. And somehow our energy together kind of creates this new inspiration for both of us to, to reach for something new in our life that we want to create. So I think also understand that also people understand that it's always a process that we're never just done. It's not like one oh. day I'm like, Great. Yeah. It's all done. You know, <laughs> finish line. Just, I cross yeah. the finish yeah. line. I'm done. No more. No, it's an ongoing lifelong journey. If you want yeah. to take that journey, yes. some people say like, I'm done, but I, I find that once we start the journey of healing and transforming and it feels so good, we don't want to stop. Yes. We don't want to stop. You know, it feels so good. So what, so you don't have a relationship at all with your mother right now? I don't. Not at all. No. How did that go down? It was really difficult because yeah. then the rest of the family structure had to adjust to that. 
Yeah. So, you know, now all the abuse is on my brother because he's the mm. only other sibling. And mm. of course, my dad defends her because it's his partner. I, I wouldn't expect anything less. And so mm. I was able to see my dad once uh, alone. I picked him up. I took him out of the house and we got to see each other. I offered to go do that again. And he said, I'm not going to do it if you won't see mom. And I said, mm. well, you know how I feel. I understand how why you're defending her. Um, I don't expect that to change. And you also know how I feel and what I need to do take care of my health, my sanity, my well-being. So I guess I won't be seeing you either. Mm. So. so do you speak with your brother or anyone else in the family? Yeah, my brother and I, we talk, we text a lot. And my dad and I text a little bit, mm -hmm. um, but it is what it is, you know? And, and so there's going to be different boundaries that people need to set too with the people who are still in contact with the abuser. Yeah. If you're, to, if you're going to go no contact with them, then you have to be careful what you're sharing mm -hmm. with the people, because then, you know, that information is going to get back to them. Right. Right. And then you, you have to be careful of the abuse by proxy because they will use, especially the more sophisticated types. Like my mother is, she will use other people. She will plant ideas in their head and get people to think it's their idea. And then they will, come with that information or something to me. So you have to be very careful with your boundaries still mm. with the entire structure because it is a system. It's not one yeah. person, it's a system. <clears throat> so when you went, I'm thinking of people that might be listening, like, how do you do that? How do you go no contact? You just had a conversation with your mom. No. Can you just let someone, no. else, let someone, let, again, someone might be thinking, how do I do that? How do you do that? How do you how do you really to, put that such a strong boundary up with someone? I went to this seminar, Iñaki Pinuel, he's a Spanish expert in the field, and he did this seminar, and he said it's called Divorcio Express, <laughs> Express <laughs> Divorce. Wow. And, and he's like, no conversation, no words, no nothing, you just cut it off. And yeah. I was like, that's right. And the next day, I just said that I just blocked her on everything, and that was mm. the end of it. So because just so does she know why did you ever send her a letter or an email or a text or no, anything no the year the year before that we had had a conversation about the abuse and she went through every tactic in the book to deny to turn it around mm. you know to all that stuff yeah anything but accepting self-responsibility so she knows you know and i gave her time and a year later nothing had changed but, you know, the, the danger is that I think a lot of times people think, well, if I could just have that one more conversation or mm -hmm. if I can just point out that one thing yeah. or, or maybe I'll just tell them this is why I'm mending the relationship. But when you give explanation for boundaries, toxic people just see that as points to keep negotiating with you on. So that's why the express version is usually the easiest way. I like that. The express divorce. Yeah, that was good. Wow, this was so good. Um, Meredith, how, how do people find you if they want to learn more about you? Inner Integration is my website. They'll find everything on there, including links to the social media, Inner Integration on YouTube, the podcast, Instagram, and Facebook. I love that. Inner Integration is beautiful. Thanks. Love that. All right, my dear. Well, thank you so much for, you know, really sharing all of this. I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that it helps a lot of people and thank you for all of your work. It's beautiful. Thank you for inviting me. Your work yeah. is amazing too. Yeah. Thank you. I appreciate you being on today. Thank you. Okay. Hope that you enjoyed this conversation that I had with Meredith Miller definitely go check her out for more information. Don't forget her book, The Journey, A Roadmap for Self-Healing After Narcissistic Abuse. And again, we've got the membership all about love this month, you guys, for $1 until Valentine's Day. That's at theadultchair.com forward slash membership. And of course, don't forget, check out theadultchair.com forward slash TAC circles. That's the meetup, free, free, free meetup group all around the world. We would love to see you at one of those groups. Okay. That's all I've got for you guys today. I will see you next week seated right here in the adult chair.